Hello, everybody, and welcome to this latest in the Values Jam guest session series. And Jenny, thank you for joining today. To start with, please introduce yourself and the great work that you do. Thank you so much, Alan. I'm happy to be here. So I'm um, Dr. Genevieve Duncan Obobi, a long name. I'm actually a banker by profession for the past um, 15 years. I've been working as a banker with, um, I'll say different banks, but I did 13 years with Fidelity Bank Ghana. So, and then I did two years with Ghana Commercial Bank. Um, currently, I work as a lead consultant at Tarragon Edge, where I help SMEs build systems and structures to start, scale up, and make their businesses sustainable. I'll say I'm more skilled to women-led businesses, Maybe because I'm a woman and I love to see women financially empowered, not just empowered, but financially empowered. Yeah. So that together when we bring our money to support our men, life can be more beautiful. Yeah, so I, I say more of financial empowerment. And I do quite a lot in terms of um, mentorship, capacity building for the youth in the areas of customer experience, leadership, team building, and so many other things. I, 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 I do quite a number of things. And I say that I don't believe in being jack of all trades and master of none. So if you decide to be um, in two or three areas, ensure that you are good at these areas, not just being there, but practice, continuous practice makes you perfect. So I love to teach, I love to share knowledge, I love to do public speaking and I'm also an author. I have written two personal books and then I have written about two or three other books with other people. So The Jigsaw Effect was my first book in 2020. And then The Diary of the Branch Manager was my book to say goodbye to banking in 2021. And then I've also written a book with 18 other women um, who moved my heels. It's an entrepreneurship book for women to inspire them to do more because the journey is not easy, but it becomes more better if you have collaborators. And then also the Africa I met, where I spoke more in a book called My Africa, My Identity, but my, my chapter was the Africa I met, where I spoke a bit about the traditions and values that the African girl that I grew up as, I saw, and how I want to use um, globalization and wherever I have gone across the world to bring back good practices, best practices, and add my African values to it and make it more richer to impact generations that I have met and even beyond. So basically, this is Jennifer. Great. I, lo I love the, the breadth and the variety of what you've talked about, you know, going from banking to SMEs, helping youth, inspiring women, uh, being a teacher, being an author. Uh, it's, a, it's a brilliant combination. I, I'm curious, actually, to ask you, are you seeing a shift in demographics in terms of the percentage of women leaders in the communities that you work in? Yes, I would say yes, because um, I think uh, it all depends on the work that we are doing. So we've come far. I mean, women in time past were drumming a particular drum, but now I would say that we've come very far because we have enabling environment, we have support systems, so we have no excuse to say no. But what I would also say is that it's collaborative efforts. So I have um, a women's network called the WISE Network, and the WISE stands for Women, Intelligential, in Service, and Excellence. So it tells you that we are intentionally recalibrating the mindset of women and the youth that look, as women, we can actually get to support, get to collaborate, get to partner and do what we are doing even better. So consciously, a lot of women are being drawn to the fact that it is not just about knowing it and keeping it to yourself, but it's more about impact. So that is what I think we are doing. And I think in my space, this is helping a lot of young people come out of their shell. The natural or the, the regular African woman is a laid back person, wants to, can do it, but wants to do it in his or in her corner. Let me put it like that, in her small corner. 
But where we find ourselves today, when you can do it, share the ideas, get collaborators, come together, work together, get it done, get it seen, and get it, even if it's not recognized, at least you've contributed, you've impacted. For me, that is what is important. And I think in my own small way with my, my other women network, I think we are doing a great job in Ghana and even across Ghana. And I know a lot of other women are doing the same across their, their, their country. So I think women are doing better now. They are coming out of their shell now. And I think with you, our men supporting us, it will even get better. Uh, so that's good to hear. So so let's um, take the values gem card deck. I'm going to take the cards out. And uh, how many piles would you like me to make in front of me? How many piles of cards shall I make? Okay, you can make four. It's fine. Four, okay. Four or seven. I don't mind. Four, seven, nine. Well, you said four, so I'm going to do four. Okay, and that's then, fine. And then I'd like you to tell me which pile you're going to choose. One, two, three, or four? One. Pile one. Okay. First or with the first. <laughs> Let's put these to one side. And so in this pile, we've got two, four, six eight, 10, 12 cards. So now a number between one and 12. Okay, so um, eight. Number eight, okay, two, four, six. Oh, so this is a really interesting card. See what we do with this. So security is what we're gonna talk about. Jenny. And the first question is, what does security mean? And what does it look, feel, and sound like? Okay. I'll say security is just knowing that you're safe, you are protected, you are covered. And it feels, it feels, I'll say um, it's relative. So let me talk about security in my own way, in a particular angle. So how do I feel secured in, let's say, my working space? Where do I work? Do I feel I'm in a team of people who have my back? Do I feel I have people that I'm working with that I can trust? Am I safe with them? Am I protected? So this is how I want to look at it because today we are talking about values. So how secured am I? How protected am I? How covered? Is Genevieve in the midst of the team I work with at Targon Edge. So that is how I want to talk about security. I said it's relative because somebody will look at security in terms of money. Am I secured? Am I financially stable? Can I survive the next three, five months if I'm not working? That is somebody's security. Somebody's security can also be home. Do I have a place that I put my head? Can I say that when I sleep at night, I'm safe? So security is in different levels. But I would want to look at it from my angle as in my team, how I work with them. Am I protected? Do they have my back? Do I have their back? That's how I want to look at it. Yeah, and I, when I was listening to you talking about it there, it strikes me how, like you say, when we're talking about security as a value, it's really about how you feel. And yet the word security in when we use that word in life more generally, I think often we refer to almost the, the function of security, you know, so you, you've got security guards making sure that a place is secure and all of this sort of thing. Um, but sometimes it feels to me like there's a disconnect between the function of security and the feeling of security. And the, let, let me just explain what I mean by this, because um, I was talking to somebody in America about um, gun possession and use in America, okay? And I heard a story about a guy who said his eight-year-old daughter came home from school and he said, how was your day? And she said, it was okay. Uh, we had a, um, a, a gun practice. And what this means is that they imagine a scenario where there is a shooter in the school mm. and the kids have to practice what to do. And when I heard this story, I was just appalled 
because is this normal for an eight-year-old girl? I, I don't think it should be. You know, if it is normal in her life, it, it shouldn't be. And yet the answer um, to this problem, I've heard people say, oh, give the teachers guns. You know, that that will be, that's security. But that doesn't feel like security at all. So that's what I mean by the disconnect between the feeling of security and then these measures that some people want to put in under the name of security. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, I think I agree with you perfectly because, yes, um, as human as we are, we always want to be ready to defend, ready to protect ourselves. But in this particular example, I would say that I also don't agree to the fact that practice or be ready, ever ready to defend yourself in terms of even teaching our young ones, because these are values. So what values are we trying to embed in them? That's, it's okay to kill. It's okay to shoot. I mean, I would rather say that um, we should rather get the school protected because in the event where you even teach these young girls to shoot or these young kids to shoot, how well are they going to shoot against the attackers? So I don't think this is good enough a value that we should actually inculcate in our young ones. Let's try and do it in a different way. That is how I would put it. Yeah, it, it seems to be missing the point, you know, because what it's doing is a, is kind of treating... Preventing their mind to always be ready to fight. Yeah, and also it normalises it in their life, right? Which, it, for me, anyway, I, it, it, you know, different people will have different views on this, of course, but it just seems to me to be totally alien for a civilised society to be accepting that we will have people with guns in our schools shooting people and therefore we have to to practice what happens there. Uh, okay, and then what about the, the metaphor part of the question, Jenny? So security, what does it look, so what image comes to mind? What sound comes to mind and what feelings come to mind when you think about security? I guess that this. Yeah. <laughs> so when I feel, it's like I, I want to feel protected. Yeah. I want to feel that I am safe, you know, and in whichever regard, I want to know that somebody has my back. I can hug someone. I can get to hold someone tight and know that, okay, I am safe. I'm not alone. Somebody is with me. That is the feel. That is how I would feel. And that is how I would think. Yeah. And I, I um, so the feeling for me is one of warmth, actually. Uh, so security and warmth seem to go together for me. Uh, the sound of security is, I don't know what exactly it is, but it's a peaceful sound. There's no no loud noises and stuff like that to, to interrupt you. And the image of security actually is a is like a security guard um so mm. that that image you just, just out with a gun <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm not sure with a gun I think I would choose a, a security guard that was so good at martial arts that they didn't need a gun <laughs> I agree I have one proud security man handsome looking well spoken well-dressed, well-groomed. And you know, anytime I see him, I used to be in the bank then. So anytime I see him at the door, I feel safe. And when customers come in and they see him, they feel safe. So I get you. Yeah. Now, Jenny, you've mentioned the word safe quite a few times at the beginning of our conversation. And so I'm, I'm wanting to understand from you what you see as the difference between safety and security, or are they the same thing? I would say it, it goes hand in hand, or it works together, let me put it like that. Because um, safety, you, 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 cannot, you cannot be safe if you don't have a sound security. You cannot be safe if your, your security is left on the loose. You cannot say you are safe when you don't feel protected and secured. And that is why most times, let me go to the typical like uh, contest. 
That is why most times in our homes, when we say we've secured our homes well, we have a security guard. We have some sort of alarm system. We have some sort of barbed wire. You know, we feel we are secured. It tells us that we are safe, you know, so it works together. Once you're using the word security, safety is in there. Okay. And I, I think I've got a slightly different view because I'm I'm what I'm thinking about here is um imagine that you're in a very peaceful, beautiful environment where there is no threat. So you are safe, right? You feel safe. That but there's no need actually for security. So there's something about I, I'm I'm wondering, just exploring here, that it seems to me that the difference between safety and security is that security is in response to some threatening external source of some okay, sort. Okay, I get that, that dimension as well. Yeah. Yes. So Whereas, if you feel safe, then there is no need for security. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So yeah. in that way, then we'll say it's like the opposite. Yeah, so, so when, yeah, so what we're saying is that when you don't feel safe, that's when you need a sense of security in order to reinstate that sense of safety. That's that's helped navigate the way through that. That's that's good. So let's um let's get more practical now. Um, here's a, a question: When have you noticed a lack of security? Hmm. This is this is this is going somewhere but it's fine it's all part of the learning process i would say honestly that when in my first marriage i felt that uh, the union is supposed to make you safe because you know where you feel you are down where you feel you are worried there is somebody that you can fall on there is somebody that you know is there to protect you so I remember when I had um, a series of miscarriages, I had like eight of them. And I felt I was all alone. I felt I was left loose. I felt I was out there to be, you know, <laughs> captured by everyone. I felt I had nobody to actually lean on, except, I mean, I'm a believer of Christ. So I accept that and then my family support system. But in terms of the person that I feel at that moment was some security to me, I felt that person was not there. So that's why I said this is going somewhere. So at that point in my life, I felt I wasn't secured. I was left all by myself. I wasn't protected. Yeah, so that's, that's how I would look at it. Okay. And I, I'm sorry to hear of your... Oh, no, that's fine. I've gone past that like... Eight years ago, <laughs> so it's it's my my, and I think these are all good because you know when some of these things come up, you never know who you are encouraging out there. You never know who is down going through something. So it's okay for us to share, and I mean nobody takes anything personal. No, and thank thank you for being willing to share that. My my example is more of a professional one. And funnily enough, it relates to uh, an environment that you're very familiar with. So I worked in an investment bank and uh, they were making redundancies. And it was incredible the impact that it had on the behavior of the people that were working there, my colleagues. And some, and I think earlier in the conversation, Jenny, you said that Security is relative, didn't you? I think I seem to remember that. And yes, I, th I think this is probably a story that um, explains why that is the case. So some of the people in the bank who either were long serving members of staff or perhaps towards the end of their career who had a good pension and all of this sort of thing didn't seem to be too bothered about what was happening. But younger people that had been there not as long, they were really concerned. And it was quite interesting because the behavior of some of them would completely switch. You know, previously they had been really good people, team players, 
uh, wanting to collaborate. And because of this news of a, a program where some people were going to have to leave, suddenly those people were out for themselves and nobody else. And it was quite astonishing to see the turnaround. So that was an example of where I remember seeing this lack of security people fearing that they would no longer have a job and everything that that would bring, uh, some of them with children and mortgages to pay, commitments. And that's why it reminded me of your comment about it's relative, because it's all about the context rather than what is actually happening. Perfectly. And what about the other side of the coin then, Jenny? Where, where have you seen security in place? I'll say my job. Okay. My job, yes. I'll say my job as a banker. I, I, I would always look back and say, whereas people thought um, you have to just be straight jacketed. It's all about targets, going to look for the money and all that. I saw it differently because if it's a good thing. So I would love to mention their name, Fidelity Bank. I mean, I felt so secured. I felt so secured because I got in in 2009, I'll say entry level. Within two and a half years, it's not because somebody liked me, but hard work, consistency, and focus. I had worked so hard that becoming a branch manager, initially acting branch manager within two and a half years, when the opportunity brought itself, I said, High end area, flagship branch. It was not. It was not. It was not difficult to become. And then two and a half years, just after my three months to six months um, probation as a branch acting branch manager, I became the full branch manager. And this was when I had even lost a pregnancy, so I've stayed out of office for six months, but I was still given the role to continue to play as the branch manager. And beyond that, I remember my educational, I went back to school. I was traveling almost every now and then when I have the opportunity to go on vacation, I travel. When I travel, I get the opportunity to learn something, come back with. And I saw growth. Although I was doing so many things, I was at the bank, I was working on my figures. At the same time, I was doing the things that makes me happy. People would say that, you can't be so secure in such an environment because your job is threatened. They would say you're not working, you're, you're tending so much to yourself, but it didn't happen in my case. I was so happy that I felt secured. I felt I was just being me, my authentic self. And because my work was being appreciated, because I was doing what I was expected to do, let me put that one there. You are asked to work. So first of all, make sure you are doing what you are expected to do. Then you can add the extras. So when the extras came in, although some people would call me and say, I want to go and speak on TV. Do you think it's a safe? I'm like, I am doing it. I don't know whether it's safe or not. I am doing it and it's working for me. Make sure that you're doing what you have to do so that when you go and do it, it doesn't create problems for you. So I'll say in that context for the past 10 to 12 years, maybe I'll say eight years in that role, I have been who I have been. And I have grown with that. And I feel, and I felt so secure. I felt so protected. People have my back because these are my definition for security. I'm using them. Mm -hmm. I felt people had my back. People trusted and I trusted people. I could speak to people. I could speak to my bosses and tell them that this is my next level. This is what I want to do. Do you think it's okay? And regardless of the environment, you say, go ahead. Once you are giving us results, why not? And so I think in that phase of my life, I felt so secure. That's a great answer. And it's making me think about how you've talked there about your colleagues and the work environment and all of the rest of it, providing some of that sense of security. But what you also talked about was you being able to be your authentic self. And it strikes me that when you are able to be yourself, that is perhaps the biggest sense of security of all, um, because the external things can have an impact. Um, but when you feel comfortable with yourself, that gives you more strength than maybe anything else. It makes you, it, it makes you, what's the right word to use? 
it makes your growth and progress exponential because you feel you are you. You are yeah. doing what you love. You are yeah. in the right environment. And you, you reminded me, uh, my eldest daughter, she shared with me a number of years ago, she went to a workshop and one of the things that she learned there was a technique called the dinosaur. And what this involved, she, she explained that the facilitator said that when you're going for an important meeting or conversation or an interview or whatever it is, remember those times in your life when you have been complimented or you've done good things or you've made great achievements and think of them as behind you like a great big dinosaur tail. And what the facilitator said was that with that great big dinosaur tail behind you, you will be strong and you will not be able to be knocked over. And I, it's just struck me, uh, I've remembered that for many years and shared it a number of times. I never found out who the guy was that um, shared the, the approach, but it strikes me as really strong because when you've got that sense of security, you feel kind of that nothing can beat you. Energy, energy. <laughs> That's it. Then you become so strong. You become so powerful. Yes, humble. Yeah, yeah. That's it. yeah. But so that so that power is not abused. Um, I think that there's a quote by Martin Luther King. He talks about how um, power without love can be so dangerous, but love without power has no impact and he talks about how it's the two that need to be hand in hand to be most effective um i can't remember the the quote word by word so as we're recording this uh, jenny there are troubles in different parts of the world and this is a, a particularly poignant question how could more security improve the world i can say that again how could more security improve the world? Um, I would say that, um, like you said, what we are seeing now, we are having a lot of challenges in terms of security across nations. And um, I think as much as all of us are doing our bit, bit in the political space, let me put it like that, I would want to look at it from everybody's point of view or um, individual point of view. What can you do? What can I do as Genevieve to make sure that there is security where I am, my jurisdiction, my local, my country? So let me use country specific. So for instance, where I come from in Ghana, we have pipes, different tribes, right? So how would I ensure that I am an Akan? I work with Ewers or Evers. I work with the Guns. I work with the Northness. I work with different people. How can I ensure that my talk, my words, my actions are not in a way instigating fights or tribal wars or conflicts among people, even when it comes to worship or religion? How do I ensure that in a, in, a, in a civilized environment where I work, how do I ensure that I'm a Christian? But how do I ensure that diversity, me understanding that I'm a Christian, but you can be a Muslim, you can be a Buddhist, you can be an atheist, you can be anything, but I still need to work with you. Once we get the concept right, that security starts from me, Genevieve. Once I am not saying things, I am not instigating things, I'm not, I'm not bringing about things that will cause confusion. Even when it comes to our political um, thoughts, I might be aligned to a particular political party. You may be aligned to another. We are all at the workplace. How do I ensure that my words, my actions, even in my doings, I don't create confusion that would instigate conflicts? And once conflicts are instigated, remember, our security is not assured. Because once somebody feels you are victimizing me because I belong to this set, or I belong to this part, or I, I belong to this group, and that person's security is challenged, 
what happens is that negative motives, ideas, and that is when people generate evil thoughts and that can affect our security. And once my security is affected, remember, so many other people depend on me. Their security will be equally affected. So what I want to say is that in trying to solve a global issue, let's look at it from a local perspective. So how are we in our little small ways ensuring that there is peace, there is harmony, there is, there is a, it, I don't want to use the word equality because it can never be equal, but let's ensure that there is fairness so that people feel that they are also cared about. People don't feel that they are marginalized or they don't, they don't matter. And so they can now think that, okay, once I don't matter, whatever I want to do, whether it affects you or not, I can also do. And I think this is what is happening globally because once I feel I don't belong to this, I belong to that. And I also feel that I don't matter. So let me go to the people, let me align with the people that I matter to. Then we can connive and then have issues that we don't really care about when it comes to security. And I think that is how I want to look at it. I don't want to go too deep in the political scenes, but as leaders, I want to advocate that let's preach and practice it in our own small way. Because if we are talking about values, it means what do I stand for? How am I ensuring that in my own space, I am not creating confusion that will create threats in terms of our security. And then once my team members understand, it can escalate to the next level. And then they also make sure that they are doing that at their level. Even when it comes to um, salary or packages at work, how, how fair are we being so that people don't feel insecure? Once they are not secured, evil thoughts comes to mind. And then this can escalate into other things like we are seeing globally. And that we are seeing it in a different space because this is about power, this is about um, territory issues. And we don't want, I don't want to go too much into that. Yeah. I think you touched on some really important points there because <clears throat> when we focus on our differences and we start to think of ourselves as different tribes, that's when perhaps we are tempted to regard others as a threat and then we are tempted to put in place security in order to seemingly protect us. But in fact, it's not, because in order to really achieve security, like we were talking about earlier, we need the feeling of security, not the function of security to be in place. And I really like what you were saying about when you're working with different tribes, you're focusing on you know, we're, we're all the same, pretty much. So, you know, why do we have to become obsessed with the differences when there is so much that is the same? Um, and then the final thing that I would add is you talked about, I think you mentioned fairness. And when you said that, I was thinking, you know, if only in the world we could have, maybe there's more things than this, but fairness, dignity, and respect then you wouldn't need the function of security because people wouldn't feel threatened and there wouldn't be scarcity of resources that people are competing over. So actually, this is making me realize that security, the feeling, is a much more important value than pre before this conversation I'd really considered. Um, now, in, in Values Jam, there's also a, a possibility to create your own question. So I'm going to invite you to do that now. So ask your own question about security, beginning with who, what, where, when, why, or how. And this is a question to the two of us. And either I can go first or you can go first. Okay. How would the world look like if we all felt that there were no issues with security? How would it feel like? Well, in my immediate reaction is that it would feel so much better than it does at the moment. Um, but then, because we are human, I wonder how long that would last before 
certain people. <laughs> what? I said, exactly. Being on somebody brings a problem that will make all of us feel so unsecured again. <laughs> yeah, because I'm thinking, you know, there would be some people that want just that were greedy and wanted more. And then when that starts, it's like a disease and it just spreads like the pandemic. Um, and then before you know it, you're back to square one. So I am I know that you are asking a kind of provocative, idealistic question. Uh, and what you did to me was took me to a really great place, but it only lasted like that before. Ideal that, life, which is not, yeah. not too possible, yeah. Yeah. What's your answer to that question? And where did the question come from? Oh, I, I, I would say that I'm just looking at the ideal situation, which I mean, the probability we all know. So I'm looking at the ideal situation where I, as Genevieve, I'm behaving in a rational way. You, as Alan, you are behaving in the rational way. And like you said, scarcity is not a problem. So once Genevieve is eating, I know Alan has to also eat. I'm thinking about you. I'm thinking that whatever I feel, I should feel the same way for you. So just as the scripture tells us, love your neighbor as yourself. So whatever I'm feeling that is good for me and my home, I am thinking that it will equally be good. And I think as much as we are saying that it's not ideal, some years back, this is how society used to be. Because the Africa that I met, that I said I wrote about, I'm looking at where I met my grandma, who even when she's putting it in her mouth, and you say you need it, you're a neighbor, she'll give it to you. Because she thinks that she has more, or she can have access to another. But you will not. But I tried it in some different ways in Ireland. I can't talk about it now. Because the trust level, people are so dishonest. So, you know... My grandmother did it. My parents have done it. I have seen it and I'm trying to do same. But in doing same, in my generation, what I have seen, the dishonesty and the distrust. So I ask myself, will I now teach my son that when we are doing good to somebody, have one eye open? Do you get the, the, the angle I'm coming from? Yeah, yeah. So all as, or as much as I want to look at it in the ideal situation, that is what I would love. And that's how the question came. I know it will take us some time. It is doable, but we need we need a serious paradigm shift in the way we think as human beings. And we can all start it in our own small way. That's how I want to always end it. That I can do my bit, Alan can do his bit, and then the ripple effects. Because if I don't, and I'm just thinking about myself alone, self-centeredness, it would affect your home. Once it affects your home, my security is not assured. Because if you are not fine, you're having plans on how to attack my home. I'm not safe. Yeah, and I, it, it's um, this this whole balance between the system and the individual's efforts fascinates me because exactly like you say, if we are true to ourselves doing the right thing, you would hope that that would have an impact. But I fear that the system sometimes is just so strong and set right. that lots of individuals can put a lot of effort in, but the system is still there. Um, but Alan, let, us, let me just take it from this angle as well. Who makes the system? Are they not individuals who make the system? No, and it's what? we. Go on. I mean, the system, who makes the system or who puts the system in place? It's been, it's been done over the years by people. Yeah. And now it has become it has become what it is. Yeah. So don't you think that with the right mindset, that is determination and being intentional about it, we can actually affect the system again. It will take us some time. It will take a lot of work. It will take a lot of good people to be in there to re-examine and affect the system it's just happening in other places i mean Rwanda is doing a brilliant thing although they also have their backs they also have their issues but i think we've seen it happen in different jurisdictions i go to dubai quite a lot i spend a lot of time there i see that the system is different who made the system so it used to be a desert we all know today it's 
a serious attraction site. People from all over the world keep going there. What about Malaysia? Ghana had independence, same year with Malaysia, I'm told. History tells me. But the different, the, 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 the system is not the same. Who made it so? One human being or a group of people came together. So as much as I know it's a system, I beg to differ that when good people decide, when people who are intentional decide, people with values decide that we want to affect the system, we would all start going into where the system is. So if it's politics that good people need to get in there, they need to get in there and affect the system. But when all the good people decide that we don't want to be part like myself, I don't want to be part of politics and all of that, and we are all staying back, who gets the system changed and affected the way we want to see? Yeah, and that, that's such a good point because what you've highlighted in the examples that you've given are the role that governments play in creating the system because undoubtedly they have a strong influence, right? And then the next question is, well, who are the people that are attracted to being in government? And like you've just said, many of the very good people are not interested in being part of that. And I was talking to somebody recently about how, and this was about politics in this country specifically, and we were talking about how Maybe a hundred years ago, people that were attracted to politics were people who wanted to be of service to society. And secondly, they were honourable people. And so even when they were from a different political party to somebody else, they respected each other because they were honourable people. And they all collectively wanted to be of service to society. And then we compared that with our view of politics in the UK today, where it seems that people go into politics for power, not to be of service to society. And secondly, they will go to any length to get what they want, rather than being honourable people. And so if, to your point earlier about how the system can be changed, I totally agree with you. The issue is when you're not starting from a blank sheet and you have people in position of power with a vested interest who doesn't who don't want it to be any different, basically. Um, but that doesn't mean to say that we can't keep doing the good things in in our own control. Um, so <laughs> you did say that you didn't want to get into politics. And what have I done? <laughs> So let's, fine. it's all part of I mean, life. It's okay. <laughs> so let's um let's just draw this values jam to a close now, Jenny. There's always the same question at the end, which is this: What are you encouraged to do differently about security as a result of our conversation today? Okay, thank you. So I, on my um, from my angle, I'll say that. Maybe my take away is going to be what you said, that in talking about security and safety, I would now look at it as if we are safe, if we find ourselves in a safe environment, in a safe world, why then do we have to worry about security? The world is having serious issues with regards to security. So the call to action is how are you going to think differently from today as you listen to us on the particular discussion how am i going to think differently how safe am i going to make my environment how safe am i going to make the people who live around me feel how safe am i going to make sure that my community feels if i have what it takes to make an impact in the community i live in how well am I going to do it so that nobody feels there is a problem with regards to security? Everybody feels safe. There is no need for you to worry yourself about security and who is coming to shoot you in the night when you are asleep and who is coming to steal something from your home and who is coming to kidnap your child. Nobody would worry about that. So that is what I want to take away, that I would rather focus more on getting a safe environment than to worry my head with security. And yeah. once I have that mindset, I think the positivity helps 
So once I have the positive mindset, it encourages me to do things that will create the enabling environment that is safety. And then I won't have to worry so much about how protected I am in yeah. terms of security. Yeah. And just to trans, well, to play back what you've just said in a, like in a short sentence, I think what you're saying is rather than focus on the symptoms, focus on the cause. So rather than deal with the issues that happen and then put security in place, what you're saying is if we just focus on creating a, an environment where people feel safe in the first place, that's going to be a whole lot more productive. Um, yeah, I mean, th this has been a really thought-provoking conversation, uh, Jenny. In my action, I, I'm going to look up that Martin Luther King quote and, you know, the, the love and power thing, because I think that might be part of the answer, actually, to creating this feeling of safety. So I'll send that to you. Um, yeah, so you I'll be great. As well. So thank you very much for your time. Thank today. You. And I love that book, the book on values right behind you. And I'm going to grab one. <laughs> Do which one? Which one? The green this and one. black. Yes. Uh, yeah. So that that's about the values economy. So it talks about how there are three drivers um, which make things different now than they ever were before so uh, we make choices on a different basis we used to make choices on a pretty financial basis whereas now we're making it on the basis of what is important to us so fair um, trade fair trade is a good example you know people are willing to spend a 25 percent premium because they believe in the way that that product got onto the shelf. So choice is the first one. And the other two begin with C as well. So the second one is communication. So this is all about the internet and social media and how we're able to share our thoughts and feelings with millions of people all over the world. Like we are doing now. In a heart, yeah, in a heartbeat. Uh, so communication is the second C. And then kind of connected to that one, the third C is control. And this is about how organizations used to own their brand. So, you know, in the bank that you used to work for, the senior guys would lock themselves away for a couple of days, come up with how they wanted to be seen in the marketplace, and then use advertising and public relations to get that message out there and kind of hope that enough people would believe them. Whereas now, because of the communication piece and because of transparency, organizations are no longer what they say they are. Instead, they're what other people say they are. And that includes their customers, their employees, local communities. So those three C's, choice, communication, and control have created a perfect storm, which I refer to as the values economy. So you can get it on Amazon. Um, I, you, you have Amazon in Africa, don't you? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So is it South Africa only? No. I, I I don't buy through Africa, but I, 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 I'm on Amazon. My book is on Amazon, so right. okay. my accounts, I, I get well, Enjoy it. and I'm, I'll, I'll I look. would actually pick one in the UK. I'll be there soon. When I'm there, I'll let you know. Well, if I'll pick an auto, autograph one. And also, well, if you're coming to the UK, I will give you one as a gift. We should meet. Oh, that would be nice. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so, so much. So let me know the dates and we'll sort that oh. out. Cheers, Jenny. I will. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure.